Do you know who received the first Sahitya Academy Award in English? And do you know uh, the chronological order of Homi Bhabha's works, Nation and Narration, the Location of Culture? Do you? If not, no chinta, here I am. Hello, how are you? This is Hina from Team Walad, back again with more questions based on chronology to help you be better and better at the upcoming net exam. Yes? So, without wasting any time, let's start with question number one. Five questions, but detailed analysis of everything, even in the options, right? Question number one. In which year did the Indian Education Commission or the Sixth Commission in the history of Indian education under the chairmanship of Dr. D. S. Kothari submit its report? Easy question. In which year did the Indian Education Commission submit its report? Okay. A, 1956, B, 1966, C, 1976, and D, 1986. One option has to be cancelled right away, which is A, 1956, because this commission was set up only in 1964. So it cannot submit any report before its formation. So cut it, cut it. 1964, it was formed, the Indian Education Commission. It took two years for it to prepare the report, which means option B, 1966 is the correct answer. I'll tell you everything about IEC right away. The Indian Education Commission, also known as the Kothari Commission, was an educational commission established by the government of India in the year 1964, I told you. It was chaired by Dr. Dalat Singh Kothari or D.S. Kothari, an esteemed Indian scientist and educationist. And what was the purpose of this commission? It was to review the Indian education system comprehensively, which means in detail, and to make recommendations for the improvement on de and development of the same. Basically, how to improve the Indian education system. We need a report. And this report was given by Indian Education Commission. It took about two years to complete you know, this review, this comprehensive review. And the report was submitted on 29 June 1966 to whom? M.C. Chagla, the then Minister of Education of India. Okay, but one important thing, although Kothari Commission was related to the education system of India, yet it left out two important domains in its survey. What are those two important fields of education that were left out by the Kothari Commission? First, legal education, and second, medical education. Easy, very nice. So now you know it, Indian Education System submitted its report under Dr. D.S. Kothari in the year 1966. Aage question number two. Literary theory is very important. Arrange the following literary theories or literary movements in chronological order of their emergence. A, cultural studies. B, postmodernism. C, feminism. D, surrealism. E, reception theory. Choose the correct answer from the options given below. So here are these five literary movements. Oh, so important. I think the oldest is feminism. What do you think? C hai kai. They make the options very easy for difficult questions. Even if you know one thing, just tick mark and it will be right. For me, feminism came first. So it has to be option two. Is it? Is it? Is it? It is. Look, feminism evolved in late 19th century, followed by surrealism evolved in early 20th century, followed by cultural studies, mid 20th century, followed by postmodernism, 1950s and 1960s. And the last one or the latest one is reception theory under reader response criticism of the year 1980s. Abhi, ikdam itna strictly yaad nahi karo. Let's understand about all these theories first and then you will grasp. Let's start with the chronological order only. So I will start with feminism first. What is feminism? 
It examines how literature strengthens or weakens the economic, political, social, and psychological oppression of women. Either the women strengthens or weakens through literature. Feminism explores it. Key figures in feminist literary criticism include Mary Wollstonecraft, Virginia Woolf, Simone de Bois, Elaine Scholter, Sandra Gilbert, and Suzanne Gubar. Feminism as a movement can be divided into several waves, actually into four waves. Each wave had its own aim and its own success. I will tell you about these four waves of feminism. First wave, late 19th to early 20th century. It focused on legal issues. Remember women's suffrage or the right to vote? And yes, women did get the right to vote. Second wave in the United States. Second wave, 1960s to 1980s. This wave focused on sexuality, family, the workplace, and reproductive rights. The famous slogan connected to second wave was the personal is political. They are connected to each other. Personal, political, connected. Second wave of 1960s to 1980s. Followed by third wave of feminism, 1990s to 2000s. The third wave focused on identity, intersectionality, reclaiming derogatory terms, which means to address the needs of women of color, LGBTQ plus women, and women of various cultural backgrounds. This is what the third wave focused on. But it was considered that third wave was not too much of a success, and therefore came the fourth wave. Fourth wave focuses on the use of digital technology and social media to advocate for women's rights. Actually, let me tell you, we should not say that, you know, this wave was not successful or that one was successful. You can say feminism is a work in progress. That is how you should put it, you know. First leads to the second. Whatever was left in the first wave was brought up in the second, was then brought up in the third. What was left in the second, you understand. It's a continuous process. So fourth wave, 2010s to current, it focuses on, of course, everywhere there is technology, internet, social media, use of digital technology and social media to advocate women's rights. And this fourth wave focuses on issues like sexual harassment, body shaming, and rape culture. Nice. Feminism ho gaya. Ab barte hai surrealism. Surrealism actually evolved as an art and cultural movement that developed in Europe in the aftermath of World War I, that is, in the early 20th century. Surrealism expressed the unconscious mind to explore the realm of dreams, fantasies, and the irrational. Basically, after World War I, when the world actually was not stable, when people had, you know, the soldiers returning had shell shock, when everybody was like, was this war killings worth it? During that time, this movement called surrealism evolved. When you don't stop what comes in your unconscious mind, rather you let your mind play. You let the dreams, the fantasies and the irrational come. Okay. Surrealist artists allowed the unconscious mind to express itself, which resulted in the depiction of illogical or dreamlike scenes or ideas. I have given this beautiful picture, which is a perfect example of surrealism. These are illogical ideas. Look at the walls, which are hanging like clothes. Yes? Now, who was the leader of surrealism? Andre Breton. Andre Breton, leader of surrealism, said that, quote, surrealism resolved the previously contradictory conditions of dream and reality into an absolute reality or a super reality or surreality. Understood? Surrealism can be seen in painting, writing, theater, filmmaking, photography. And another famous surrealist along with Andre Breton is Salvador Dali. Now, what are the features of surrealism? You know, because I told you it's dreamlike. So what should it have? Surprising just juxtapositions, unexpected imagery, symbolism and metaphor, unexpected, dreamlike atmosphere, 
automatism, that is stream of consciousness. Next, absurdity and humor. Next, freedom and spontaneity. All these are features of surrealism and why? Because they challenge the conventional ideas and provoke new ways of thinking. Okay, surrealism. Next, kya hai, literary movement. Cultural studies. Cultural studies is an interdisciplinary field of academic study that explores the social, political, economic, and cultural aspects of human societies. Actually, Cultural studies concerns itself with the role of social institutes in shaping of culture. And it emerged in late 1950s, 60s, 70s, first in Britain, then in US, Australia, and other parts of the world. Cultural studies investigates how cultural practices are related to power and how culture is constantly changing. You know, it is dynamic, it is not stagnant, it is not fixed. And cultural studies became identified with, tell me, with, yes, a center, triple CS, Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies was, you can say, inaugurated or it became an academic field in itself. It got its place at the University of Birmingham. And this triple CS was founded in the year 1964. Scholars associated with cultural studies are the famous ones, name them. Richard Hogarth, Stuart Hall, and Raymond Williams. Hogya cultural studies. Ab kya aega batao? Postmodernism. Postmodernism refers to artistic, cultural, and philosophical movements that mark a break with modernism. Where modernism breaks, postmodernism begins. Because postmodernism convinces that yes, we can break away from the existing reality. What we think is real right now, we can break from it and we can move towards postmodernism. We can break from the historical narrative and move towards postmodernism. But still, there is a disagreement about more precise meaning of postmodernism. However, let's start with the evolution of postmodernism. Somewhere 1950s, 60s, although in 1990s, that is late 20th century, postmodernism came to denote a general celebratory response to cultural pluralism. So cultural pluralism and postmodernism are connected to each other. What are the features of postmodernism? Tell me. Playful use of irony and pastiche. You know what is pastiche? When I copy a piece of art... Yes, I do. A work of art, piece of art that is deliberately copied. You know, it deliberately takes the style of something else. That's pastiche. Postmodernism does it. And there's a strong influence of postmodernism, which can be seen on literature, art, architecture, philosophy, as well as cultural studies. Why? Because it talks of cultural pluralism. This is postmodernism. And look at a postmodern architecture. Can you see? It actually is away from the current conventions of how buildings should be built. It is beyond ordinary, beyond modern. It's postmodern. Last, reception theory. Reception theory within the context of reader response criticism focuses on how literary texts are interpreted by the readers. Reception theory emphasizes that the meaning of text is not fixed, not inherent, but any text is created through the interaction between the text and the reader. When I read a text and I try to analyze it without considering what the author wants to say, that becomes a reception theory. How I receive it, a reception theory. And this theory emerged in 20th century, influenced by scholars like Hans Robert Hoss or Joss and Wolfgang Eiser. Reception theory has had a significant impact on literary criticism. Why? Because it gave importance to reader responses alongside textual analysis. So literary criticism deals with textual analysis. Together, textual analysis and reader responses, they were placed together. Right? Easy? Ho gaya? Ek bar wapis question dekhte hai. Arrange the following literary theories or movements in chronological order of emergence. So... Feminism came first, followed by surrealism, followed by cultural studies, followed by postmodernism, followed by reader response theory or reception theory. 
हो गया आगे बढ़े इट वॉज बिग वन नो थर्ड वन आई ट्राई टू कीप स्मॉल ओ इट्स नॉट इट्स अगेन अ बिग वन चलो करते हैं करते हैं धीरे धीरे जस्ट चिल गो टेक अ ब्रेक यू कैन कम बैक एंड लिसन टू दिस अगेन फाइंड द क्रोनोलॉजिकल ऑर्डर ऑफ द राइटर्स इन टर्म्स ऑफ देयर ईयर ऑफ बर्थ ईयर बताना है अब सबके डेट ऑफ बर्थ याद करो अपनी फैमिली के तो करो इनके भी करो वेरी एसेंशियल ए जेन ऑस्टिन बी हेनरी फील्डिंग सी जेम्स एम बेरी डी रिचर्ड डॉट रिच ब्लैकमोर और आर डी ब्लैकमोर ई विलियम मेक पीस ठाकरे और डब्ल्यू एम ठाकरे किसका बर्थडे पहले आता है किसका बाद में आता है किसने पहले केक में कैंडल की और किसने आखिरी में की कैन यू टेल मी ओके वी कैन से दैट हेनरी फील्डिंग एक्चुअली इज द ओल्डेस्ट आउट ऑफ द टू और नो Uh, or is it Richard Doddridge Blackmore? Well, I don't remember. Come on, let's see. It is Henry Fielding. It is Henry Fielding. So Henry Fielding came first on Earth, followed by Jane Austen, followed by W. M. Thackeray, followed by R. D. Blackmore, and last or the youngest is James M. Barrie. पढ़ते हैं इन सब के बारे में बिल्कुल पढ़ेंगे. First Henry Fielding lived from 1707 to 1754 his active period was the augustan age or the enlightenment era henry fielding was an english writer and a magistrate he was a master of humor and satire his most famous work is the history of tom jones of foundling which was a 1749 comic novel and also henry fielding is considered to be the founder of the traditional english novel along with samuel richardson so he who founded this english novel they were henry fielding and samuel richardson henry fielding 1707 next jane austen 1775 belonged to georgian era look at her english novelist yes definitely Jane Austen's six novels are very famous which comment upon the British landed gentry esteem gentry and also dependence of women on men and marriage if they want a social and an economic standing in the society they need to marry to the correct man which means a rich man okay all this Jane Austen spoke about in her novels which were located or you can say the setting was at the end of 18th century now do you know the six novels of jane austen which has made her so famous even till now yaad kare you know i remember them like this s p m e n p s p m e n p s for sense and sensibility which was published anonymously in 1811 followed by pride and prejudice published 1813 followed by mansfield park 1814 followed by emma 1816 followed by northanger abbey and persuasion both of them published posthumously in 1817 sp m e n p <laughs> easy next w m thackeray 1811 born 1863 demise he belonged to the victorian era he was an english novelist and illustrator although he was born in india british india as it was called then he was very famous for satirical works and his most famous works w m thackeray's most famous works are vanity fair a panoramic portrait of british society and the next important work is the luck of barry linden that is w m thackeray from victorian era born 1811 followed by r d blackmore born 1825 victorian era again actually r d blackmore is called as the last victorian He is one of the most famous English novelists of the second half of the nineteenth century, and his works, just like Thomas Hardy, are filled with vivid descriptions of the countryside, personifications related to countryside. That is, there is a very strong sense of regional setting. Whose works are D. Blackmore? Okay, his very famous novel is Lorna Doone. Lorna Doone and the last novelist belongs to the Victorian and the Edwardian era is James M Barry born 1860 till 1937 a scottish novelist and a playwright 
James M. Berry is famous for creating the famous character of Peter Pan. Who created Peter Pan? Berry. Before his death, though, he gave the rights to the Peter Pan works to Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children in London. Basically, he gave his royalty or the rights to a hospital of children in London, which continues to benefit even till now, you know, from the Peter Pan novels. And the famous works related to James M. Berry are The Little White Bird and Peter Pan and The Admirable Crichton. Okay? Can we repeat now? Bataye, chronological order of the writers in terms of their year of birth. Henry Fielding, followed by Jane Austen, followed by W. M. Thackeray, followed by R. D. Blackmore, followed by James M. Berry. Done. Let's move on to question number four. I asked you this one at the start of the video. In which year was the first Sahitya Academy Award in English installed, or you can say given away? A, 1960, B, 1961, C, 1962, or D, 1965. First Sahitya Academy Award in English was given in the year 1960. To whom? To R.K. Narayan. For which novel of his? The Guide. Do you want to know a little bit about the Sahitya Academy Award? Let's know. Sahitya Academy Award. Oh, ho, what this period? Just delete this, huh? Period Victorian. No, no, no. Wrong. Just Sahitya Academy Award. Sahitya Academy or the National Academy of Letters is an autonomous organization in India that promotes literature in various Indian languages as well as in English language. What? Who promotes it? Sahitya Academy or National Academy of Letters. So the awards which are given by Sahitya Academy are given for works published in any of the 24 languages which are recognized by the Academy. So what is the aim of giving these awards every year? The aim is to promote Indian literature throughout the world. It was instituted or it began in 1954, although in 1960, the first Sahitya Academy Award in English was given. Now tell me the latest, who got Sahitya Academy Award in English the last, that is in the year 2023. Who received it? 2023. That's the fun quiz. It is Neelam Gaur or Neelam Saran Gaur. She received the latest Sahitya Academy Award in the year 2023 for her English novel Requiem in Rag Janaki or Janaki. Requiem in Rag Janaki. And one important thing again, the award as of 2022, this Sahitya Academy Award, consists of one, an engraved copper plaque, two, a shawl, and three, a cash prize of one lakh rupees. Okay, good enough. Let's move on to last question of the day. Arrange the following works in order of their year of publication. Very important works related to important writers. Again, we have to tell which work came first and which came the last. What are these works? Listen, A, Orientalism, B, Nation and Narration, C, Black Skin, White Masks, D, Decolonizing the Mind, and E, The Location of Culture. See, out of this, Nation and Narration and the Location of Culture are by Homi ke Baba. Orientalism, Edward Said. Yes? Abhi batati na, sare. Come on. Can you choose the correct answer? Baba has to come the last. So it has to be like B, E at the end. I think it's option four. It is option four. You might be thinking, khudi questions banati hai, khudi answer banati or fir surprise hoti hai. It is four, not three, four, two little bit of, you know, excitement is important so that you don't start feeling sleepy. The answer is four. I did not know. I just know right now. Let's start with all these works. First one, Black Skin, White Masks, published in 1952, written by Franz Fanon, who's a very famous French Afro-Caribbean philosopher, was, of course, style. Black Skin, White Mask is written in the form of autoethnography. 
in which Fenor shares his own experiences while presenting a historical critique of the effect of racism and colonialism on the human psyche. Basically, it's an autobiography because Franz Fanon tells his own experiences, but then he goes to the historical critique of how colonialism has impacted the human psyche. The violence, the violent overtones that Fanon uses can be broken down into two categories in black skin, white masks. First category is violence of the colonizer who rules. And second is violence of the colonized who is submissive. So violence of the colonizer happens through annihilation of body. Annihilation is complete breakdown. Annihilation of body, psyche, culture and demarcation of space. This is the violence of the colonizer. Second, violence of the colonized. Why will the colonized do violence? To attempt or to retrieve self-dignity and also to create history through anti-colonial struggle. These are the two violences in Black Skin, White Masks, published 1952 by Franz Fanon. Second work, Orientalism. This is 1978. Orientalism, 1978. Written by Edward W. Said, who was a Palestinian American philosopher. First, you should know what is Orientalism. This term was used by the West. Even now we say Orient or the East. So the term used by the West in not a good manner, but you can say in a contentious or a derogatory manner to depict the East, the Orient, the Asia, that is North Africa, Middle East, Asia. All these places are called Orient by the West. It's a contemptuous term, which means not a good term. In his book, Orientalism, Syed critically ex examines Western representations of the Middle East and the concept of Orientalism as a form of cultural and political domination. Syed also argues that Western literature on the Middle East actually serves colonial and imperial interest. So when the West, you know, it like the literature of West on the Middle East is a way to colonize, is a way to act superior, okay? Easy. After 1978, 1952, 1978 will come 1986, Decolonizing the Mind, the Politics of Language in African Culture. This is the complete title. Many a times complete titles are also asked. So I've got it for you. Decolonizing the Mind, the Politics of Language in African Literature. Published 1986, written by Gugi. Gugi Vathiongo, who? Kenyan novelist and post-colonial theorist. Decolonizing the Mind is actually a collection of essays. It is essays about language and its constructive role in national culture, history, and identity. Or you can say decolonizing the mind actually talks about linguistic decolonization. Okay. There are four essays in decolonizing the mind. Should I tell you the names of theirs? First, the language of African literature. Second, the language of African theater. Third, the language of African fiction. And fourth, the quest of relevance. So there is literature, theater, fiction, and then relevance. Remember it like this. And also a very important point, decolonizing the mind was Googie's farewell to English. This book was a farewell to English language after which Googie stopped writing in English. Decolonizing the mind of 1986. Let's move on to Nation and Narration of 1990. Abhi homi ke baba hai, dono. Nation and Narration and the Location of Culture. Hey, location of Culture is 1994. Isko sahi karte hai. Abhi pehle Nation and Narration. Let's do. Homi ke baba, an Indian scholar and critical theorist, born 1949. He is 74 years currently. Baba, in the preface of Nation and Narration, wrote that, quote, Nations, like narratives, lose their origins in the midst of time and only fully encounter their horizons in the mind's eye. What does that mean? That nation and narration book is a celebration of the fact that English is no longer an English national consciousness, which is not nationalist, but is the only thing that will give us an international dimension. English for us is important, right? Throughout the world, 
wherever you go yes english we have to pick up if we want to converse if we want to have a proper travel we should know english yes that is a fact so baba says in nation and narration that english no longer is that english national consciousness which means the people of england it is not their national consciousness for us it is a natural thing for us gaining english is a natural thing if we want to have an international dimension easy next by homi ke baba again is the location of culture publication date year is 1994 please correct it and in this work the location of culture baba uses concepts like mimicry interstice hybridity liminality why does he use all these concepts to argue that cultural production is always productive where it is most ambivalent so cultural production when ambivalent will be the most productive this is what the location of culture talks about published in 1994 so this takes us to the question again arrange the following works in order of their year of publication black skin white masks 1952 followed by orientalism 1978 followed by decolonizing the mind 1986 followed by nation and narration 1990 followed by the location of culture 1994 and we are done for the day how did you like it if you liked it ek comment to banta hai and also share this video with your friends with anybody who is preparing for the net exam and other equally important examinations yes this is hina from team walak take very good care of yourself tata bye bye